Going with the review for Mac 1114, Chapter 7, um, we are continuing with number 9. Okay, and number 9, you're asked to find the tan of 75 degrees. And since you can't go directly to an exact value for 75 degrees, we're going to re-express the 75 in terms of reference angles that we can create special right triangles for, which would be 30 and 45. Those are two reference angles that we know well because they belong to special right triangles. Um, in order to use um, this split up, you're going to need to know the formula for the sum of tangent, which is a quotient, and in the numerator it would be the tan of each of these angles that you've split up the 75 into. And in the denominator, be 1, switch that sign, and then form a product of those same two tan values. Okay, then you can plug into each of the for each of these tan values and you either have those values memorized or you can draw a special right triangle for each of them trying to recall the values on the legs that go with these reference angles so for 30 this is the position for the reference angle across from the 30 would be the short leg always uh, the angle up here would therefore be 60 and the long leg is always across from the 60 in a special uh, right triangle that's 30, 60, 90, and the hypotenuse is 2. For 45, that would just mean that the reference angle is 45, which would make this angle 45 as well. And if these two angles are equal, then the two legs are equal. You can assign any values you want as long as they're equal to the legs. Using a 1 on each of them just makes it easy to calculate the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse in this type of triangle is square root of 2 times a leg, times either one of these legs since they're the same. Okay, so from these triangles you can form the tan. Tan is defined as y over x and that definition and knowing the values is going to help you to plug in here to get the exact value in the final answer. Okay, so tan of 30 would be y over x. 1 over square root of 3, tan of 45, y over x again is 1. In order to continue working on these and combine them, you're going to want to rationalize the denominator by multiplying denominator and numerator by square root of 3. That would get you square root of 3 over 3. And then in order to combine what you have here, square root of 3 over 3 with the 1, you might want to rename the 1 using the same denominator that you have here. So that would be 3 over 3. Pull these two fractions together into a single fraction now that they have the same denominator, which would give you this. Okay, now working on the bottom, you have 1 minus the product of the two tan values that you've already established in the numerator. So tan of 30 was this 1 over square root of 3, but we rationalized it to square root of 3 over 3. So we'll use it in that form here when we plug it in in the denominator. And then the tan of 45 was 1, so it's 1 minus square root of 3 over 3. Again, redefine the number 1 using the same denominator as you have in this other fraction. And then once these denominators are the same, you can pull them together into a single fraction like I did in the numerator. Okay, now you have what's called a complex fraction, a fraction divided by another fraction, and you can continue to simplify that um, by floating the, this denominator here, this entire fraction, up to the top and turning it into multiplication by the reciprocal. So we're going to leave the numerator as is, no flip, no reciprocal. 
but we're going to float this entire fraction in the denominator up alongside of it in the top, flipping it over and multiplying by the reciprocal. In this way, the threes cancel, and instead of having two fractions, you now have one. So it's square root of three plus three. That's what's left over in the top, and what's left over in the bottom is three minus square root of three. Okay, so now you're at this point, no longer have a complex fraction, but you do still need to rationalize this square root of three in the denominator. And when square root of 3 is combined with another number, part of a binomial, this is a binomial, and there is a, a plus or minus sign, you're going to want to multiply by the conjugate in order to rationalize it. You can't just multiply top and bottom by square root of 3 because of this, this minus sign. Conjugate is the same expression that you're looking at, but with the sign in front of the square root switched. Okay, whatever you multiply the bottom by, you're going to multiply the top by it as well, that same expression. And then I'm going to point out to you, I keep trying to harp on this in class, that there are shortcuts when you are squaring a binomial. See that this, both of these expressions have the same terms. They both have a positive 3 and they both have a positive square root of 3. So you're actually squaring the same binomial. Here, you're not doing that. On the bottom, you're multiplying by the conjugate, and there is a shortcut for each of these. On the top, you're going to use square, double, square. And this is for when you're squaring the same binomial. You're multiplying by the same binomial. Square, the first square you see means square the front. That would give you three. Um, the doubling part means imagine the product of these two. In other words, they would look like this right up against each other. That's what the product looks like. And then when you double a term that has a radical in it, you double this coefficient out front. So that would be 6 square roots of 3 instead of 3 square roots of 3. That's the doubling part. And then when you square um, again, when it says square again, that means square that back term. So I was looking at this front binomial the entire time. The signs for this shortcut is that the last term will always be positive, and the term in the middle will have the sign that is common to both of these binomials. Okay, and then we'll clean that up even further in the next step. Okay, then the shortcut for the bottom, when you're multiplying conjugates, you go by this shortcut. Square minus square. You can, again, either be looking at this back binomial or the front. You'll get the same answer either way. The first square means square this first term. The second square means square the second term. And you put a minus in between those two squares. Continuing with this, and I do want to point out that had you foiled, you would have had four arrows, one from this first term to the three, another one from the first term um, to the square root of 3, and then from this second term, you would add another two arrows. So there would have been one, two, three, four products for foiling, and then you still would have had to combine like terms. So it would have been five steps. This In this way, with the shortcut, I only used three steps. You would have had those same five steps for the bottom, and instead I did it in two steps. So you've cut out quite a bit of steps by knowing the shortcut. So trees you know, please try to use those. Okay, continuing with the top, you can combine like terms, 3 and 9, which is 12, plus 6 square roots of 3, that's as good as the top's going to get, and the bottom would be 6. Reducing further, only because all three coefficients are divisible by 6, you can reduce further. 6 goes into 12, so I'm dividing everything by 6. All the coefficients, that is, this, this, and this. Don't touch that number. Okay, so 6 divided into 12 is 2. 6 divided into this is 1 square root of 3. 6 divided into the bottom is also 1, but since the denominator is 1, you don't need to mention it. Okay, and that's number 9. Moving on to number 10. In problem number 10, you are asked to find the inverse cosecant 
of 2. And you are allowed to use your calculator here, but the only problem with this, which is why I threw this on the practice exam, because if this was a um, inverse that you actually had a key for, there'd be nothing really to show you. You just press second function, touch the key that has this trig function on it, and you get the answer with no work whatsoever when they're saying you can use a calculator. However, the challenge of this problem is that, again, as I said, there's no key. So you're going to want to rewrite this first as a non-inverse equation. And all you have to do is switch the sides that these two items appear on. So the two will come over here. This will be written as a non-inverse statement. And now the theta will take the place of the two. Okay, then in order to be able to use the keys that are on your calculator, you're going to want to rewrite this in terms of those keys. Cosecant is the same thing as 1 over sine. And the 2 is still here. And then a form of cross multiplication, partial cross multiplication, is where you can just switch these two and you still have a statement that is equivalent to what you had here. So sine of theta will take the place of the 2, and the 2 will take its place. So they've switched places. Okay, now you can use your calculator. Anytime you are looking for an angle, you're going to finish the problem by using inverse sine. So this is going to be inverse sine, again, when you're going from a non-inverse to an inverse, or vice versa, as we did up here. All you have to do is switch this term and this term. So the one half will go here, and the theta will go here, and now you can use your calculator. Remember, with inverses, there are restrictions. And for this particular problem, you're um, entering inverse sine into your calculator. The restrictions are that the answers have to be either in quad one or quad four for inverse sine. Now, you're looking for the sign, um, and a, a theta that goes with a sign that has a positive value, which can only be here. So of these two quadrants that are allowable under the restrictions for inverse sign, this is really the only one you can end up being in. So go ahead and put that in your calculator and you'll see that the answer that you get is in fact in this quadrant, which obeys the restrictions and it comes from a positive sign value. And that would be 30 degrees. Now your calculator would have to be in a mode of degrees for it to um, produce that answer. Okay, that completes number 10. Number 11. Problem number 11, you are looking to solve this equation. 6 times sine of x minus 5 is equal to negative 2. Okay, and this, since it's a first degree trig equation, you're going to want to isolate this trig word by moving the negative 5 first to the other side, at which point it'll be positive 5. So now you're looking at 6 sine of x equal to 3. Divide both sides by 6, and you end up with sine of x is equal to 1 half. So you are looking for the angle x. Usually there's a theta here, um, but it's an x, and you're still looking for the angle that goes with a positive sine value of 1 half. There are no restrictions here because you're solving an equation. You're not doing an inverse. So according to all students take calculus, all of the trig functions are positive here. So sine is definitely positive here. You're going to have one answer right here in this quadrant. Okay. And then where else is sine positive? Well, the S stands for the sine being positive. And the reciprocal of sine would be cosecant. These are the two trig functions that are positive. These letters stand for the ones that are positive. Everything else would be negative. So you can either be in this quadrant or this quadrant if you want a positive sine value. Drop down to the x value to the x axis, excuse me. Create those right triangles, attach these numbers. Sine is defined as y over r. So the 1 is represents the y or the vertical leg. 
the two represents the radius or, or in other words the hypotenuse this would be the long legs so what you're looking at is across from the one would have is always the 30 degree angle and then the other one would be the 60 but we're only concerned with the reference angle because the reference angle is what determines where this terminal side is the side that produced um, the hypotenuse in quadrant one the reference angle and the terminal side are the same, but in every other quadrant, they're not. So you have to think a little bit harder. Now in this problem, they say that you should find the answers between 0 and 2 pi. And this indicates that they want the answers in pi form. So 30 degrees is equivalent to pi over 6. And I'm going to use that knowledge as I go to find this other solution. So again, 30 degrees is pi over 6, so if you're thinking in sixes, denominator of 6, this would be the 6 sixes mark. In other words, 1 pi or 180. So if you were rotating, rotating till you got to where this terminal side is right here in quadrant 2, you would be traveling, almost would have made it to 6 sixes, but you stopped this um, one six of a pi short. So that means this is at five sixes. That's one of the solutions. This is the other solution where the sine is one over two. Okay, and that's your solution set. Pi over six and five pi over six. Okay, moving on to problem number 12. Problem number 12, you are looking for the solution to cosine of 2 theta plus cosine of theta. And as you look at this equation, you're going to want to notice that one's a double angle, one is a single angle, and uh, preferably you want them both to be single angles because if you leave this as a double angle those problems involve um, a lot more technique. So I'm going to um, replace this or substitute the equivalent of cosine of 2 theta. There are three different ways to represent that. Uh, this is one of them. 2 cosine of theta. That's a single angle but you're going to square that. It's not the same thing as 2 theta plus cosine of theta. Oops, and I forgot the rest of this. Excuse me. Okay, so the equivalent of cosine of 2 theta is 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. And drop that plus sign. So we now have a 1, 2, 3. Three terms is a trinomial. Second degree, so you have a quadratic trinomial, and to factor that, you're going to want to put these terms in descending order. So it's second degree term, first degree term, constant. And that can be factored as follows. In the front position of each of these parentheses, you're going to want to factor this down. So to break this up such that when you multiply them together, you get two cosines squared, you're going to have to have one of the cosines here and one of the cosines here. And then, of course, that two is going to have to be with one of them. So I'll put it up here in the front. This last term being negative means that the signs will be opposite. One will be a positive, one will be a negative. Filling in the back position just requires you to factor this constant. And the only way you can do that is 1 times 1, so that makes it easy. This has to be a 1. This has to be a 1. When there are various options for factoring this number, that makes it a little bit harder. Okay, now we know 1 has to be positive, 1 has to be negative, and this is how you go thinking about which one of these gets the positive and which one gets the negative. Um, when you're checking to see if you factored right, you have to think about foiling. Foiling is the opposite of factoring. And as you are foiling, you see how each of these terms are achieved. For instance, when you go first term times first term, you get this. 2 cosine theta times cosine of theta, that gets you that term, so that works. 
And then there are two things that go into this middle term right here. Part of it comes from here, outer term times outer term. That would be 2 cosine of x times 1. We'll talk about what the signs need to be in a minute. And then the other portion of what makes up this middle term is when you go inner times inner, which would be 1 cosine of theta. And then these two products get combined to give you the middle term. So again, that middle term is made up of two products that happen here. And then, of course, there's that last product, but that last product has nothing to do with the middle term. Okay, so realizing that these are the two pieces that go into making up the middle term, we can now decide which of these is positive, which of these are negative. This is the bigger product because it has the bigger coefficient, and the bigger product should have the sign of the middle term so that when you combine these, so this will be the positive, this will be the negative, and when you combine these two terms, you get positive 1 cosine of theta by combining those coefficients and that's exactly what we want in the middle so that's the thing you have to think about especially when the signs are going to be opposite so the 2 cosine of theta which comes from this product right here that should be positive while this one should be negative okay so now that's factored properly because a lot of people just throw whatever they want in there rather than thinking about whether the signs are going to produce the proper middle term. So that's what that discussion is about. Now you create linear equations out of each of these factors. So this factor gives us this equation. You just set each of the factors equal to zero, and you're going to get the solutions from each one, each one of these equations. So, these are both first degree equations. You're going to want to isolate this trig word by moving the other terms to the other side. That would give you 2 cosine theta equal to 1. Divide off that coefficient, and you are looking for where is the cosine positive 1 half. Again, by using the all students take calculus, you know that cosine is positive in this quadrant and cosine is positive in this quadrant. Okay, we are looking for where these terminal sides are. Those are the thetas that we're looking for. Okay, so let's put these numbers on the triangles and that will help us to figure what the reference angles are, which will help us to figure out what these thetas are. So this will be one of the answers. This will be another answer. In both of these quadrants, the cosine's positive. So, cosine's defined as x over r, so this will be the x for both of the triangles. The r is the hypotenuse, and this is the classic 1 square root of 3, 2 special right triangle. Okay, the vertical leg here would be uh, square root of 3. This one would be negative square root of 3. But across from the bigger leg is always the 60 degree angle. In this problem, you are allowed to answer anywhere between 0 and 360. Okay, so this in the first uh, theta here as a solution is the reference angle. And then by the time you get into quadrant four, then this terminal side is not the same as the reference angle, which is also 60, but it tells us that this terminal side is at 300. Okay, so these are two of the solutions so far, 60 and 300. Then we need the solution for this other equation. Again, isolate the trig expression and you get negative one. Where, at what location for theta, at what angle would you get a cosine value of negative 1? That has to do with the unit circle. So you'd be going right here to 180 degrees, and at 180 degrees, these are the coordinates. Negative 1, 0. The x coordinate represents the cosine. This is the sign. So this is the location where you have a cosine value negative 1, 180 degrees. Remember, the solutions are all angles. So you have 60 degrees for one of your answers, 180 degrees, and 300 degrees as your three solutions. And that completes number 12.